Our intermission is over here for the mid-season brawl, and now it's time to get back to serious business here as we've moved on to Group B, and we're going to have Tempo Storm going up against L5 to figure out who is going to be getting some spots here in the standings, and these games really do matter. We'll talk about how that's going to go down in just a few moments' time. I'm joined here by Grubby, Trixler, and Fan once again, and overall, this is an important series for Tempo Storm, I would say, more so than L5. Of course, L5 is in a good spot right now. They are definitely going through, it would seem, other than the fact that they, if they're able to take a 2-0 here, they could tie it with Team Dignitas and try and rival for that second spot. Yeah. I think there's actually a crazy tiebreaker scenario where if L5 loses 0-2 to Tempo yes. Storm, Soul Torture's 2 O's E-Star, they would tiebreaker, and then That's if true. they lose the tiebreaker, so L5, if they lose both matches here, they could potentially not make yeah. the top eight. So they're going to be heading in, I think, very serious for the wins. That is a good point, yes. That's yeah. correct. Looking Five at the maps would have to go in the exact same, like in the exact definitive result yeah. Yeah. in a row, and then L5 could be out of the group. It's unlikely, but it's a fringe situation. And L5 to stop that just wins one today, and they're good to go, right? Yeah. You know, Any right. One it's of a those really five. weird scenario. Yeah. I mean, they need to, L5 needs to win one of three, and they need one of the other two maps not to go that way, and they'll be safe. But insofar as it's in their own hands, they need to win at least one map here, preferably two. Then they can be into the winner brackets yep. of DreamHack playoffs. And then on the other side, you've got Tempo Storm, who is also very serious about this. They're currently set at five points. Soul Torturous is on four points right now behind them, uh, and they'll go up against E-Star after this. So depending on who gets points there, we could quite easily see Soul Torturous take over and start rivaling uh, that spot. Yeah, and I just got the thoughts uh, of Tempo Storm, mm -hmm. and June said, uh, miracle will happen. Uh, so they're hoping to win here against okay. the favorite, L5. And Cawthon said the only way to secure their advancement through the group here is 2-0 victory. That way they will yep. not be dependent on the Soul Torture E-Star result. Yeah, because if you put your hands in the fate of other people, then who knows what can actually occur there. So it's a big deal. Very, very big deal is this series and the next one coming up uh, as well here. So Trixler, overall, looking at how these two match up, of course, there is that crazy fringe scenario here where L5 could be knocked out or whatever. But Tempo Storm's got a tall task on their hands. A tall task, but one that might be achievable based on what we've been seeing from L5 in the last couple mm. of days. They've dropped some matches that you wouldn't think they would have dropped in the past. So there is always this weird wild card scenario out there. Can they do it twice in a row? I'm not sure, but I could see ourselves in a world where we do get a 1-1 for Tempo Storm, just based on what we've seen in the past. Honestly, I can see a world where we get a 2-0 for Tempo Storm. If the Tempo Storm that beat Dignitas yesterday shows up, they need to play clean without any mistakes. Right. But honestly, um, you know, L5 coming into this tournament, I had them as the top team in their group. However, as the tournament has progressed, my power rankings right now for their group is E-Star at number one, Dignitas yeah. at number two, L5 at number three, and Tempo at number four. So you're, for my power rankings, you're talking about a third versus four seed. So I can actually see the 2-0. Unlikely, but possible. It's kind of a crazy scenario we found ourselves in here, considering how this group has panned out overall. There is Sam as well. Grubby, what other thoughts do you have on uh, Tempo Storm as a whole? Well, Tempo Storm, they started the tournament by showing a very oh. strong macro play, very strong uh, heart facsimiles as well by Fury. <laughs> That's, I think, his second one, very close to perfection. Mm -hmm. Great macro play, but every time it came to a team fight, Tempo Storm looked disappointing, not just relative to the level of the top teams, but to themselves. Right. I don't think they really came into their own. There was one game where I finally thought, Tempo Storm is here to play. Yep. They've shown up at mid-season brawl, and that was their game against Team Dignitas, where they took a more meta-accurate draft, mm -hmm. and they played it really well with Chen, Abathur, Uta, Genji, that kind of style. Yep. So I am now a believer in Tempo Storm. Day one to three, not so much. But now I finally believe, even though the odds are probably stacked against them, that they could do it against L5. And on the other side, there is indeed L5 here, as we take a look at them closer now. They've had a rocky road through this group stage, not something that you would consider really for a previous world champion uh, coming into this. So how do, you, how do you see L5 at the moment? Um, L5, like I said before, they're, they're kind of like, just, just like MVP Black, they didn't really adapt to the tournament's meta at the start of it. Yeah. Both Korean teams looked uh, you know, relatively weak compared to what we expected out of them when we first 
began the tournament, and both of them have been rising up ever since. However, I feel like MVP Black has been adapting a lot quicker than L5 has been. Yeah, I think that's the way that I would put it too. It's just L5 right now, they seem to... Every time they run into something that's a little bit different, whether it be a Zagara wild card or anything that looks a little bit off, it throws them off, and they have a couple of games, they get a response, they get the draft they want, and then they answer back pretty handedly. So I'm actually hoping to see that Chin that you were mentioning earlier to be played against L5, because I want to see how they would handle the Chin that comes in, but it's also something Tempo Storm is very comfortable with. Yesterday, after the actual match, Kata was mentioning they've been practicing that strat in particular for the last three to four months, and he was happy that he finally had to pull it out. Let's not forget, though, that although L5 has looked weaker, and I think we are correct in saying that with our expectations of a multi-time World Championship winner, uh, Swoy did say they're confident in this match. Uh, this is a team with excellent mechanics. If they can get their meta right, they could do pretty well. And he also said he thinks they'll win this match. He thinks they will win the tiebreaker with Dignitas, get top two in this spot, and go up against MVP Black and Dreamag. Now, that's quite a few steps they need to complete, but the <laughs> yeah. confidence is there. Definitely is, definitely is. Let's take a look at the maps that we're going to have between these two teams. Not only the picks, but also the bans. And we had White Junction banned out by L5. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the Infernal Shrines banned out. We're going to be going to Towers of Doom first and then Cursed Hollow. So Towers of Doom to start things off here between the two teams. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm happy for the Towers of Doom, but I'm even more happy for the Cursed Hollow second pick. It's been a bit Warhead Junction-esque and then Sky Temple for Tempo Storm. Yeah, yeah. And Sky Temple, I feel like they have a strategy, but it's one strategy that opens itself up to them playing safe and constantly macroing out. And if you beat around the bush for a little bit too long, eventually you're going to trip over weeds. And that's happened a couple times that I think against L5 that would occur again on Sky Temple. Mm -hmm. So going to Cursed Hollow, where they looked much more strong in their macro game and more yeah. aggressive, I'm happy to see that as their pickup. All right, game number one here. It's a big game as we do have Tempo Storm going up against L5. Uh, we go to Towers of Doom. Yep, Towers of Doom. I believe this was the map pick of L5. Looks like yep. they will most likely have some sort of a plan leading into this. Tempo banning out the Dahaka, showing that they do not really want to first pick it, and they do not want to let L5 have it either. <laughs> Double Abathur global. Ban, uh, yeah. was instrumental in the victory of Tempo Storm over uh, Team Dignitas. Yeah, I believe Abathur has a over 90% win right now, 92, right? 92, 13 wins, one loss. Yeah, really high stats for that hero. Um, respectable ban there so this is going to be an interesting game now outside of the false dad there are not that many globals available there are some pseudo globals with like illidan and hunt at 10 but for the most part this is probably just going to be a non-global game i don't think taking an early game advantage on Tem towers of doom is as good as on some other maps running the style the tempo storm used so well with illidan the hunt on mm. cursed hollow before could come back and bite them in the butt talks because they could take an early lead, but eventually you're going to have to face L5 on open combat, and the hunt yep. doesn't do as well in that 5v5 scenario. I'm expecting the Uther or the Genji here. Every time that an after has been banned out, that's what Tempest Storm's gone into, and they actually choose to grab for the Uther here. L5 on the other side, though, will they walk into the Genji territory? Yeah, I have to imagine that they do take the Genji there, along with the Unibrak. Pretty solid one, too, for L5. This leaves out of the power picks. A lot of them are taken away. There's still the gray main available right now. There's still out of the meta picks, actually. Gray main might be one of the last ones to stand out to me here. I think uh, slowly it is emerging that Genji punishes low HP characters. That may seem mm. incredibly obvious, of course, since that's when he gets his reset. But you see that it has been emerging that teams are trying to draft a little bit more unkillable comps, whether that is with Double Warrior, where one is a supportive type, like Zarya, Diva, Chen, or something like this, uh -huh. Tyrael, or uh, double support, or both even. So uh, you make yourself first unkillable, and then maybe you will do killing later. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one more thing I could see is maybe them going for some sort of either Vala plus one or Tassadar plus one. Those two can branch out into different things, of course. So we have to see what they take here. And it looks like it's the Tassadar plus one. Good call. Definitely helps with being a bit more hard to kill. Tassadar and the Murden. Do you think even with the Vala, I know you have an Uther and a Tassadar and that's unkillable in a state. Is Vala one of the best things you can actually deal with Genji pressure coming your way? Or would you rather have a Grey main? Um, I think with the Tassadar, I would prefer a Vala. But in North America, 
um, you know, Gale Force Esports is really the only team that highly prioritizes Vala to the level of the Asian teams. So Tempo and um, Roll20, I don't think they prioritize it as high. And it shows in the HCC NA games that they have. What do they have to consider ban wise? Does Tempo Swan play much Tracer at all? They. I don't think they play it too often, but some has played it in the past in HCC NA, so it is not impossible. It, it is a possibility. And well, now it's not a possibility. <laughs> 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 of course, uh, it has to be looming on the minds of L5 that Illidan could be an option here. When we see Uther yeah. toss Muradin, we see some counters to Illidan being taken away. Same with Tracer. And so, did L5, do you think L5 made a mistake banning Tracer instead of Illidan? Um, I I don't think so. I think Tracer Tassadar is a composition that scales a lot better into the late game. Tassadar Illidan, while it still is good into the late game, it, it doesn't quite have the damage that Tracer Tassadar can provide. Yeah. So I, I think the Tracer Tassadar is the scarier of the two. What do you guys think about this, by the way? The more that we've seen in Nubarak, the more Li Ming has become more of a staple, where teams are trying to either take away the Li Ming in the early side via Roll20, or Tempo Storm looking to ban it out before it's even pickable for L5. I think the Li Ming here is a good ban specifically against L5 because Nacho Jin, historically, his two most played heroes, the ones he defaults back to um, for almost the entirety of L5 minus this tournament, have been Li Ming and Falstead. Those are his yep. bread and butter signature heroes. And forcing him off of those, we've seen some performances of uh, Ragnaros from Nacho Jin. We've seen some performances of Gul Dan, and he does not look quite as comfortable on those heroes. Yeah. Um, he does sometimes get caught in the early game, and you can kind of tell he's just not as familiar with the hero as he is with Li Ming or Falstead. I think L5 is thinking about Illidan here on the other side of Tempestorm. So they need to make use of these two picks out of the three that they have remaining to deal with that. Several options are anything that blinds. Uh, they take it themselves. Well, there you go. Okay. That is a very heads up play. That's one way of dealing with it. Otherwise, they'd be taking Arthas, and then you're not sure if Illidan really still comes out when you already have it. I like that uh, attempt a lot, but it's definitely something that is not 100% ideal when you don't have Tusk yourself, but it's still pretty good with Rhaegar. So what options beyond uh, Valor and Greymane exist here? You can go with the Lunara, as we've already seen a few mm. times before, but I, I feel like those are the big three. There's not much left with the Tracer being banned and the Illidan being picked up here. What I, about Cassia, Lily? Or, no, not, not triple support. Cassia is another good option, actually. Cassia. I think Cassia can work. Cassia might be the one that fits Tempo Storm's style the most. Um, I would prefer a Vala personally, but once again, Gale Force is the team that plays Vala in NA, and I don't think they're going to go that route. I think Cassia is a more Tempo Storm pick, so we'll be seeing if uh, they go with that. So in a world where Cassia gets picked up here, what does L5 think about moving into? It's and Cassia, it and there's the Chen. So I like the it. Chen again. We have the two staples that we've been seeing from Tempo Storm. We had the Cassia a couple days ago and Chen yesterday, so we they did. now have it mixed in for a Tempo Storm. Now on the right side, typically you want some form of mage, but can you afford to grab a mage here? Do you want to grab an extra warrior? Well, they could go cool done, I guess, but I don't yeah. think I really like that against the team the Tempo Storm is running. Yeah, I mean, I would even consider like a Kel'Thas or something. I really feel like they should get some magic damage. But once again, the hero pool problem. I, I don't know if Nacho Jin is comfortable playing Kel'Thas. I don't think I've ever seen him He's, play it. This is a very fringe thing, but he has played Chromie in the past. Oh, uh, and Nazebo. Nazebo. Okay. I do consider that kind of a mage. It is yeah. a decent Cassie counter as well. So I do like that pick. Oh, Nazebo coming in at the end. So what do you make of these drafts? Because Head to head, they're they're quite intriguing. Not 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 normally something you would see. Well, it makes sense to do a heavy sustained damage dealer for L5 because Illidan and Genji are great finishers. Yeah. But they're not great to start things off with against double support, double warrior. So they're banking heavily off of the easy skill shots to hit. The corpse spiders against Chen is an easy hit. You're not going to kill Chen per se, but at least the spiders are out there on the battlefield. And that's one way to get some damage done. But the thing is, Nazebo is a late game hero. It's not that great early game yet. And Chen can use the zombies to fly and kick away from trouble. So anytime Nazebo comes out against a melee assassin or a bruiser, I'm a bit iffy about it. 
Uh, we're going to go with predictions and Grubby to start with you. I like Tempo Storm's draft a lot, and L5 haven't looked like the world-class shape yet. Maybe they'll turn around, but according to the draft, love what Tempo did, going to go with Tempo. Trick. I think Tempo's better together as a unit here, but I think there are tools for L5 to control the battleground and control mercenaries better and more often. So I think if they have a strong early to mid game, their late game comes online. I'm going to go ahead and pick L5 here. Yeah, that is my main concern with Tempo Storm as well. Their death ball is superior to L5, but L5 do have the heroes that can kind of split the map apart through mm -hmm. mercenary pressure and just the heroes that they have. They can pick skirmishes instead of the fight, so L5. All right, an important series with important implications. Let's see what you have said in the chat as well. And see where this is going. A lot for L5. No surprise, they're a previous world champion for the HGC. Now let's head over to the commentary team as Dread and Kaldor are going to bring up all the action here from game number one. Korea versus North America, L5 versus Tempo Storm. We are in for a treat, Dread. I am excited, but I have a lot to share about these drafts here, yeah. specifically on the side of L5. I think they did a beautiful sweep to be able to punish Tempo Storm here in this game. Well, before we get into that, let's just introduce our players here. To the left side, we have Tempo Storm with June on Utha, Fury on Muradin, Sam on Cassia, Cattle on the Chen, and Cawthon on Tassada. And in the red here is going to be L5 representing Korea. Nobles on Anubarak, SESC on Genji, Swoy playing the Rhaegar, Zhang Ha on Illidan, and Nacho Jin on the Nazebo. So Dreddy already talked a bit about the comp here, but when we're looking at what Tempo Storm has drafted here, it seems that first of all, they look pretty difficult to kill. The question remains, do they have the damage output in the short run, in the burst in particular? Yeah, the back half of that draft was so interesting, moving into that Cassia in the Chen. It's very defensive, you know, with the lack of interrupts on the side of L5, but it doesn't have that much DPS. You know, you're looking for those really, really long team fights with that style of composition, and then sweeping right into the Nazebo, going for the most sustained DPS in the game to deal with those late game sustaining team fights. It was such a nice sweep there at the end. And one of the problems we heard from the panel already a bit about it, in the late game, when Azebo comes online, you have all that power spike that especially Illidan, of course, brings to the table. Do you think that when we have that long and drawn out game on towers that Tempo Storm is falling off with their composition here? I, I mean, yeah, it, it's going to slowly just scale with the Nazebo factor, right? He will come online in the back half of the game. The a Temple Storm also one huge disadvantage when looking at Towers of Doom specifically is the fact that they have no opportunity to have any form of global. Illidan himself does have the opportunity to move into a hunt yeah. if he wants, but it's not even necessary. How much do you think Temple Storm has a snowball here in order to really get control of this game when we are talking about that threat in the late game? Do they have to pressure the structures early? They can take a lot of the damage here with the Chen in particular, having a double support behind him. You can soak those shots and allow the rest to go in. Can they do that in the early game? It's, I mean, yes, they can get away with some pressure up into the early parts of the game, but I don't even, I don't even know if the early game is that clear towards Temple Storm, to be frank, because compositions that depend on time to be into their favor are probably, in my opinion, the hardest to be able to underestimate or to evaluate uh, without actually watching how the team fights happen because it's a lot of poke, it's a lot of posturing, it's a lot of positioning testing overall as well. It's very hard to be like, well, I can expect team fights to look like this. I can tell you, Temple Storm's main goal survive, rely on the defensiveness out of the Tassadar, the Uther, Guardian Ancient, and King Prox, the Cassia with the counter momentum and the blinds into such a melee composition. And then L5's looking, you know. Hopefully they deal the thing and then the Zebo poke them all down. When I look at this right now, and one of the things we often talk about when we see an Illidan composition is that he is oftentimes a bit of a linchpin here. In this setup, there's of course a lot of tools that we're currently seeing for L5. They have the Genji in here for the late game, the Nazebo is going to play a huge role. But when we're looking at the early fights in a 5 versus 5 scenario, what should be the primary target in your opinion from Tempo Storm? Since you can argue that trying to lock down Illidan with the stuns on Muradin, on Uther, and then dropping the Cassia damage in would be a good shot for them, but it's also a very elusive target compared to Nacho Gino on the Nazebo and Swoy on the Rega. I think that Swoy has got to be the biggest one, is trying to find a way to get onto him. That is the most optimal, just because, yes, Illidan is a good target if you can focus onto him, but most of the time he will find a way to survive. It's when the Illidan, or the Rhaegar, excuse me, overextends to try to save him, if Temple Storm instantly swaps the target, yeah. Swoy could 
could be very vulnerable. Swoy in that case already going for the wolf run on yeah. level one. So you can really tell that he of course realizes too that he is one of those priority targets for Tempo Storm. And L5 realizes if he dies, they are in trouble. Wolf run allowing him therefore to just get out of these fights a little bit faster, reposition himself within the battle. I completely agree with you there, but Illidan actually getting caught here up in the 1v1, going down. Now Tempo Storm find themselves the first blood. Very well done, and that's the momentum Tempo Storm is going to need if they're going to be successful here in the game because we know, we've seen it, the power of late game Nazebo. Yeah, and this is an incredibly important game. We've been talking about Tempo Storm, what they have to do here to make sure that they don't rely on the result from Easter later on. If they take at least a game against the fight, that would already be fantastic. If they get two, that would be even better than they secure themselves a spot in the next round of the tournament. So for now, they're focusing on the camps here as we are still seeing up at the top, Illidan now back to business trying to put a bit more pressure onto cattle. Yeah, this is very common for North American teams. They like to try to focus onto those sappers at the exact same timing here of the first triple altar. So much so you even saw Temple Storm invading onto L5, questioning if they were onto it. That is just, it's so rinse and repeat in North America that they even expected that here out of the Korean teams. But we have these altars up in 12 seconds. Temple Storm needs early shots. Again, you need to get the early advantage here over Nazebo. Yeah, and they are already going to try and do this. And before we head in, uh, just one mention real quickly. Level 1 Elusive Brawler for Chen. We need to mention it here. There's a lot of auto attack damage on the side of L5. And with the double support behind it, Chen is going to be incredibly difficult to kill. Temples, Altars exchanged already, but down to the middle. We still have the third one up as both of the teams are starting to focus on the team fight. And everybody is rotated down to this. It's a full five on five. The engage there, Zhang Ha actually eats a stun and a blind. He's trying to get the retreat there. Nice use of the friend or foe, but Tempo Storm find themselves another kill. Now, Zhang Ha being really optimistic diving this deep into five. But that was... Not very res much respect coming out from not only the yeah. dodging opportunities, because uh, for anybody who maybe isn't an Illidan main, if you're blinded, you don't get your passive. The cooldown reduction that makes Illidan the monster, if he's not actually contacting with that auto attack, he, in fact, ends up losing that. So, you know, Zhang Ha, it's kind of hard for him to understand what the cooldowns of tempo are available and what his cooldowns are going to be looking like after his auto attacks. Jumping into the five here at this point was very risky, though. You know that there's at least two stuns on your opponent, and it's not only about the stun. You talked about the blind, but more so, even if you jump out, Chen can follow you. Yeah. So in this case, him dying there again, definitely a bit of a misstep by L5. Then again, it only results in the altar channel through by Tempo Storm, so there's no momentum being built by the North American team just yet. But in the long run, he can't afford moments like this. No, it's going to be very crucial that they just tone it down a bit. You know, L5 has obviously had a lot more bloop moments kind of like that than we have ever seen out of them before, but they're going to look for this invade. Yeah, they're going in as we speak, and here comes Noblesse. He uses the burrow to go in, but dies as a result. The rest of the team not ready yet. At this point, the Koreans really paying a price for being overly aggressive. And now it's time for Swoy to eat a ton of damage as the Stormbolt connects, but Rega is able to escape in the end. All of L5 was able to get out thanks to that level one, as we talked about before, for Swoy. I, I love that talent here specifically. When you're against the type of composition that Temple Storm has created, any hero that is self-sustaining and can deal with 1v1s and 2v2s is going to be beneficial. Another reason why that Nazebo pick was so pretty here, but the early game of Temple Storm, the three kills, this is all they need. If they can keep up this momentum, we may never see the late game power of L5's comp. Yeah, Temple Storm definitely has to keep up the momentum. You're completely right about it. It's really what they are trying to do here. We also have another great talent against Illidan in particular. Having the Skullcracker here. It's a heavily debated talent sometimes depending on what exactly you're trying to do with a frontline, but Murden currently being supported by two supports in the backline and having the Chen to his side now with the Skullcracker, not only having the increased attack speed, but also the periodical stun that we can see against Illidan. And that at the wrong moment can completely screw up an Illidan that is trying to keep that momentum. Yeah, Nazebo and Chen have kept themselves towards the bottom lane, but the altar here for L5 has been concluded. Temple Storm's been interrupted, but it looks like that was all L5 was interested in. June will, in fact, get the rest of these shots. And patient play now from L5. That was what I expected, altar phase number one. Yeah. Is to just be like, guys, we traded? 
and they gave, you know, that that's what we want. You know, if we can get at least one, we're going to be comfortable. Trades right now is exactly what L5 wants and needs. Yeah. Play it even, don't fall too far behind, just let the time come in so that you hit, reach the late game, and then you're going to hit your power spikes. This is the most important thing for them right now. Identify the power spikes, play around it, and I'm actually really eager to see what happens here after level 10, especially when we're going to see what Illidan is choosing here. I'm just glad that we see this from L5 before it hit a point to where they can't turn it around, right? Only after the secondary altar phase, the experience is still even. There's only a four-shot difference, so they are actually in a fine position to still be able to get their power spikes that they're looking for. That was big, by the way. Illidan yeah. on a structure is just fantastic, and if you have even more support with you, we see exactly what happens here. Tempo Storm instead taking the camp at the bot lane. They're now trying to make this a trade, but this is a problem, especially with Tassadar all of a sudden finding himself in trouble, going for the Arcan here. Cawthon moving away, barely escaping. Jonga takes the tower as L5 moves out, but at the bot lane, Temple Storm used the time to trade and get a bell tower themselves. Yeah, the Arc using Archon there. We talk about the lack of damage on the side of Temple Storm. It is a huge cooldown, 100 seconds there. So if we find L5 a way to punish that use defensively, oh, but wait, the stun here on the Nacho Jin, it does land, but nobody has any follow up damage for Tempo Storm. Now, at this point, I'm actually I'm super happy about what we're seeing in terms of heroic abilities here. Not only because we have on Illidan the hunt that allows allows so many tools. L5 is basically saying, okay, we don't take metamorphosis here, we don't have to go all in on the team fights. We now all of a sudden have a tool to play around the opponent. We can use the pseudo global on a map like Towers of Doom to just cap an additional altar and then join the 5s5. But we also have on the side of Uth a Divine Storm. They have a Tassadar behind it. There's no real need for the Divine Shield at this point. And with a Divine Storm, Illidan hunting in has to be extremely careful where he plays himself. And where these bottom bell towers controlled by Temple Storm, this altar is in a awkward position for L5. As yeah. you see them kind of encased between the structures. So if they fail to be successful in this early skirmish, they might be trapped into just a death zone. Yeah, Dragon Blade being used, Cocoon already on the ground, Cassia is down. That is most of the damage that we're going to see on the side of, the, of Tempo Storm. L5 with the first kill and they are going in. But again, both of the Bell Towers, a huge problem currently for L5 trying to look for a second kill. Yeah, now man, one man down, Temple Storm, they're still looking to be aggro here. Cattle ends up getting the initiation, nobody of L5 even looking to start the channel. Now Swoy ends up getting the retreat, not the safest channel positioning. The rest of the team is trying to zone here. Fury was Beautiful. thinking about it for a moment, but moves back out. Correct choice, I want to say. Yeah, yeah the, the, definitely the correct choice here coming out from them. Cattle still questioning if he wants to get the initiation. But I want to kind of take a step back to the hunt. The, the, you brought up that point about having that global, because every ounce of Temple Storm's composition is not good at sieging. It's not good at doing anything but raw team fighting and having that element of the Illidan and being able to flex into that. With Nazebo there, their four man, the Anubarak between Cocoon and Nazebo throwing out the spiders left and right. Wait, convert a bell tower, get the hunt. And I think that alone, that pick, will be the reason L5 can turn this game. It puts a lot of pressure on Rega though, since without Metamorphosis, there's no stun that you can dodge by using your ult. So you can't go into this cooldown trade that we oftentimes see. Illidan players dodging a Divine Storm, for example, is absolutely huge. So Rega has to be on point. Swoy needs to identify, and he needs to drop his Ancestral to keep Illidan alive. So this is going to make for some super entertaining team fights later down the road. Yeah, it is going to be interesting. Tassadar, though, has just looked up on top here the entire time, converting the Bell Tower back. So we find ourselves at a balance. But L5 has the 13 talent here for a small period of time. But more importantly, have we... Oh, man, the hunt up on the top? That for a moment, I thought it was going to get scary there, but I wanted to, it feels like L5 has kind of woke up in yeah. this game. It, the first couple of kills, they were kind of doing their own thing, and then suddenly up after that top bell tower, they kind of were like, what if we just group up and focus on us? And this mentality shift for L5, I think, it's got to be scary for Temple Storm. You know, this is actually something that I expected not only for the map, but for the series. Because we've been talking about a very similar situation with MVP Black dropping the first map against Roll20. Yeah. And 
Koreans have a lot of pride in their ability to dominate in uh, games, to come to these competitions, the international ones, and just showcase their region, present themselves as the strongest here. And L5 cannot really be happy with what happened so far in the tournament for them. So I expect them to show up in full force and really concentrate as we once again have the hunt with Jongha hunting in. They're looking for the rebuttal here, but now L5, after the initiation, realize they want to retreat. Cattle actually started the channel, drawing aggro from SESC, but he's taken a bit of damage forcing the deflect. Deflect being used here, and here comes the cocoon as we once again have L5 going deep into the back line. Divine Storm as the suns come out, but Nacho Jin is moving away. SESC gets the answer, so the problem is that we have an Uberog in a lot of trouble, and he goes down. So much damage coming out from Tempo Storm, all pressing their R buttons at the exact same time and able to convert this fight into their favor. That is going to net them not only shots onto the core, but a sapper. What can Tempo do here with this pressure in the 20-second window? Because, again, they do not want to see the level 20s, which honestly feels inevitable at this point. They have gone way too slow in the first hard part of this game. Yeah, it's really way into it already, and we are still at nearly even points on the core. Slight advantage of Tempo Storm, and they now take the Bell Tower. Illidan, in the meantime, split to the top lane and is attempting to take a camp. He can always hunt back in to assist his team. But of course, Tempo Storm is now trying with the additional belt how to build up the momentum that we've been talking about. They need to get a lead here because L5, once they hit their 16s and 20s, is going to hit massive power spikes. I love to see this adaptation just in, from an overarching perspective on Tempo Storm. The fact that they have flexed their draft, you know, looking at the beginning of the tournament to the end to try and deal with what they see in the middle of a series, in the middle of a game, because that is probably the biggest complaint a lot of fans have of North America and Temple Storm is just adjusting on the fly. Yeah. Not, not, not coming in with a game plan and when things kind of go awry, how do we change that? And right now it looks like they have at least honed it in, gotten a little bit better at it here and part of the reason they have success in this first game. And adjusting to a meta from a different region is something yeah. you have to be able to do when you play in the additional uh, international tournaments. We've seen it every single time. A team or another brings in an idea and all of a sudden a new meta evolves. That's why we talk about tournament meta when we're looking at these offline events. The engage, but not enough well. damage there. Yeah, it, you're right. And it's amazing to see not only within each region do we see a different style, but then they come together. We're slowly getting there here even at the mid-season brawl. Uh, but then, you know, once we get past the group stages, the if evolution of the meta, it just gets even weirder and weirder. It's such an awesome thing to see here. But Temple Storm is at the 16 Talenter. They're even. The triple altar phase, they're pretty much just going to be overly aggressive on, on top. L5 again forfeiting these altars? Can they get this delay? They are getting the one at the bot lane. They're trying to lay at the top in the meantime. The fight is starting. They are only there with four. Genji is on the way. Here comes the Ancestral. That's a big cooldown already burned, but it saves a Nuburak as they're dashing out. But that was a huge victory here for L5. The fact that they were able to draw the Archon and the Divine Storm. The CC is now very, very limited. Blinds are the only fear, fear here for Zheng Ha, as you see him patiently waiting around the side. Also, Najajin with the 16 oh. right now. So much additional damage from the Zebra once again they're going in no bless in trouble no ancestral the channel is through though and nuburak falling but they already capped two of the altars they're trying to go for tassada who dimensional shifts out and it's genji who dies next a double kill in favor of tempo storm nobody falling but l5 gets two of the altars l5 does end up getting two of the altars it's just now with this shots here it's really an even trade actually temple storm with those two deaths they are going to be able to pick up the boss directly after it's just the fact that that team might went so convincingly over to temple storm here even after hitting that 16 power spike all because the sacrifice of the team fight for the shots yeah the thing is also that in this particular case, we've seen that Muradin has actually now with Given the Axe on level third, on level 16, st started to really put some additional pressure on, because we've been talking about damage. That's always a bit of a concern. We we're looking at that Cassia trap with the double support here. So this really helps in addition to it. Keep that Bell Tower at the bot lane in mind, though. We've been talking about it. Illidan has taken it. We still have Tempo Storm in the lead when it comes to the hit points on the core itself. But L5 is working slowly and steadily towards that level 20 that gave us so much uh, worry time earlier on when we were talking about the draft. Yeah, it, it did, but it just hasn't really come online, at least not yet. And I think that's a perfect thing to point out here. The fact that the, given the axe, I love 
that talent here on Murden. And it pairs pretty well with Skullcracker. There's a little bit yeah. of synergy there, so you can it goes a little less controversial of a talent, I guess, with that synergy there. But initiation onto Fury. I actually absolutely love when you go for uh, give him the axe that you also pick up the Skullcracker. And I feel in this particular setup, it is even more important since you have the mini stunts against Illidan, against Genji. That is absolutely fantastic. The one thing I want to also highlight, oh, there's a good cocoon. That could be a bit of a problem. The minions, he can dash to the minions. So they need to try. Chain it. And cattle, the rest of the team comes in. There's the heal. Shield should be there soon. But he goes for the triple panda as we are having Tempo Storm with an end gauge trying to move in. Good ancestral, but there is no way that Nacho Shin survives that. Way too far to the left. Way too far out, and now with the one kill here. But look at the members of L5. They've given up on the fight. They're trying to start the channel. Can he get it? Nobody's going to get this interrupt. And look up on bottom again. Genji finishes it. So yes, Temple, you in fact win the fight. But right now, you're losing the war. Yeah, they are. And they just got a massive, massive amount of hits against them. They are down to 10 points on the core. Nazebo up at the top, really finding himself in an awkward spot with, with all the mobility they had. They moved onto the two altars, channeled them through, and all of a sudden, L5 does not only find themselves ahead in experience, or a small margin, but massively when it comes to the points on the altar. And once again, we're having Jonga going in with Illidan, looking for a kill, doesn't get it against Cattle, but they can now once again... Oh! They, they go for it, but not to kill them again. SCSC does manage to survive. I thought there was no way they'd have that kind of confidence. Now, Fury with that Dwarf Dust, he's trying to rebuttal, but he's all alone. Dude, if, if there was a Lightning Shield from Rega as he went in, that would have been it. It would have been. And now, what is Temple? They look lost. After that couple of moments here, the top L tower is going to be converted. L5 has full control with 20 advantage. They're going to want to wait out the XP. But look at Tempo. You can see they don't have a total grasp of where they need to be moving on the map. Okay, two quick things. First of all, let's talk about Nazebo. 150 stacks at this point. So he's still not online with this level 20. They need a bit more time for it. Also, Temo is struggling keeping up with the mobility on the map right now and rotating uh, from one lane to another to reclaim these bell towers. It's five against three in favor of L5 at this point, and Tempo still has to also think about those mercenaries. Look at the top lane, where we have Illidan pushing the wave back, and that's another three shots against Tempo Storm. They're going to be down to seven. Tempo Storm sacrificing this, and they aren't able to force a fight anywhere on the bottom half of the map. I mean, you know, they did at least steal some of the sappers. That pressure is going to allow them to convert the bell tower. But moving the core slowly closer and closer to zero on the side of Temple Storm. L5 now, because they do have that global, suddenly they aren't even worried so much yeah. about team fights because they say we have not only the Genji mobility, starting with this level one talent, but the hunt to be able to move around the map and get a free altar if we have a huge altar phase up. In an ideal world, L5 delays everything until they have the quest talent, the violent faction completed on the Zebo, and that's going to be the case any moment now. We have Illidan in the mid lane threatening another bell tower, and he can always hunt into the fight, and altar is on the map seven points against 16 l5 can just simply let this one go and they are very much going to do that they're more worried about controlling and dictating the rotations of tempo storm and i think this is a beautiful decision coming out from them again all focusing on the lack of mobility also the lack of wave clear on the side of tempo storm they all end on melees they all end on team fighting and l5 has suddenly found themselves saying, what if we don't? And Tempo Storm has not found a way to be able to force any of these brilliant rotations on the side of L5. They are L5 is completely dictating the pace of this game. Yeah, they are, and they also have a very good shot of ending when they get another camp, if they go for a boss, if they win a team fight, if they sneak an altar. And we have Illidan just the entire time moving from lane to lane outside of the bot lane saying, hey, I'm eventually going to get this bell tower. And not only is he going to get the bell tower, it's going to eventually hit the point where between sappers and between the boss that's about yeah. to spawn and between just the, oh man, if they get that pick, ooh. Hey, hey, they're, Cocoon, just... they go in, they're trying to go for it, here comes Illidan, hunting in immediately, they're trying to go for Psalm, Psalm is low, barely saved, they got the stunt, a great Ancestral comes through Cassia and Cassia is down. is down! That's the, the hyper carry, that's who they need in this fight, Jun survives the three-man knockout from Noblesse, Jung -ha. Jung -ha. so what? calculated, three people are dead on the side of Temple, but Redemption is here for the Uther, can he save this on the life back? Cattle about to fall here as well, they're trying to somehow keep Jen alive, doesn't look like it's gonna happen. Uther is down. Chen 
this down. Everybody's dying. Tempo Storm is on the verge of losing game number That's one. It. It's an entire team vibe. Only Genji got sacrificed. They will take the bell tower, and that is going to start the barrage against Tempo Storm's core. And now L5 has just been counting the shots with the core. There is nothing. This game is already over, even though it is not. L5. <laughs> Beautiful play, and that team fight with no hesitation, just all in. This is game. Illidan alone on the boss, and we are having Altus on the map. The rest of L5 moves top. The barrage continues as we are seeing the core drop in points. Tempo Storm already accepting their fate. Boss is taken as L5 takes game number one and takes the lead in this best of two series against the North American team. I just want to say that though we barely get to see a shot, a three bell tower conversion shots for that long, I can only imagine mentality-wise here for Tempo Storm oh, dropping yeah. that first game. That I, I cannot think of a worse way to lose Towers of Doom. It's to just watch seven <laughs> shots singularly. I mean, L5 showed as much mercy as they could have, but my goodness, that has got to hurt here for Temple. They need to show strength. And that last fight as well, you lose Cassia first. You're a hyper carry who's yeah. supposed to deliver the final blows and all the damage. And then to add insult to injury, we have Illidan moving out of that fight with what it looked like negative hit points. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I have no idea how Jonga actually got out of that fight. Yeah. That was pretty gross. So guys, we have a 1-0 lead for L5 against Tempo Storm. And before we're going to head into game number two, we are of course going to hear from our panel what they thought about game number one. That's right. Thank you guys, L5, with the victory there on Towers of Doom. But it wasn't without a hard-fought scrap there. Tempo Storm, for the most part, were able to hold their own for, I would say, a good amount of that and really make a meal out of it. Yeah, they kept treading water, just being a little bit behind in experience, Kalaris. Mm -hmm. But overall, the team fights looked very good. And even, I think, after everything is said and done, it was such an interesting game. They made so many interesting uh, decisions as well. Yeah. And I think overall, you can just say the Tempo Storm played it well. Uh, it came down to this team fight. Nazibo got to level 20, and right. they were just a little bit, uh, yeah, yeah, they just weren't able to make that fight work. That's a good point that you bring up, obviously, the Nazebo getting as far as he does into that game. It only gets harder for Tempo Storm. Yeah. So. But on Towers of Doom, it can be sometimes very difficult to round out a game quickly. Yeah, it really can, especially when you don't have the wave clear there. The weight of what L5 had available for them, pushing in, grabbing the experience, as sometimes is only half a level, a level yeah, ahead, yeah. but that's still enough to eat the late game. In that moment, Nazebo came on live. We just saw Ilden doing whatever he wanted. He was in the top lane, the middle lane, could hunt in at any point. Because Nazebo with a 4v5 at that point does so much damage, Cassia can't get mm. in there to trade out, and eventually you just get broken down. Was there too much on Cassia's shoulders for going up against L5? It was difficult. It was difficult in the end there, but yeah, I agree with Grubby. I think Tempo actually played that game quite mm. well. Um, it was really in the drafting where they struggled. Um, in the play side, they, they did what they could. You yeah. saw L5, they actually didn't realize what the strength of their composition was for the first uh, like 10 levels. They do not win the five versus five fights, but in the first 10 levels, you saw them try and take a five versus five twice and both times they lost miserably they lost extra altars that they didn't need to they could have been split pushing on the map and they eventually adapted mid game figured out that that was their win condition and managed to end it but yeah overall i think l5 actually played really shaky that game and tempo played well and it was the drafts that kind of swung the factor over all right well I, let's take a look yeah i do have a replay here and this replay kind of tells the story of the entire game here if we could pause right now so you see the Anubrak actually bros in here, hits a four-man E. And here's the thing that I want to tell you about L5 here. They're very split on their decision-making. Look at Jiangha. He's on the side here. He's going back and forth. Look at SESC. He is capping the shrine. So there's three things happening right here. If you want to stall them for SESC to cap the shrine, that's fine. But why is your Illidan not going in with your Anubrak? I talked about this yesterday. When, when your enemy team is focusing one target, you are free to go in. Everyone else is free to go in and do damage because all the damage is being dropped on the Anubrak here. So there's three different line of thoughts here. And look at look at Jiangha, look at Nacho Jin. Uh, he, he eventually does go in here, but Nobles is already half dead. And he playing the clip here. We see Nobles eventually gets taken down. And... Uh, here, if we can pause right now, you see after Noble S dies, that's when SESC decides to go in with the Dragon Blade. Now, to be fair, a lot of these heroes were really close to dying at the end of this fight. But after your Anubrak dies, that is generally not when you want to go in with your team fight. You don't want to take this team fight 4v5. And if we can play on here, 
you see SESC, he does get punished there, instantly stunned and killed. So even though there were a lot of low HP bars on the side of Tempo Storm, I think Tempo played, you know, that fight plus yeah. the game pretty well. And you can kind of see throughout the game that L5 not really on the same page sometimes and not really playing to their win conditions fully. Because they already did what they needed to do. They sniped that Altar away. They bought time. Noblesse right. paid with his life and Genji wasn't needed for that one. Right. So just like that fight, you know, Genji could have gotten out, could have saved Dragon Blade, and they could have gone back to splitting the map. But instead, they they pick a suboptimal route. Now, Fan, I hate to put you on the spot, but do you know about the rotation of the Altar sometimes? Because the key moments seem to be when uh, Noblesse got the cocoon on Chen, top lane, which forced the entire Tempest Storm, or forced, at least they made that decision, to rotate to save Chen, and then you had that double altar for the 10 core shots. Like, do you think that L5 knew that the altars are gonna be bottom? I do not think that they knew that it was gonna be bottom. The ones that most people typically remember are the first one and the fifth one. They, there's like the three spawn, right. and everything after that, um, you know, from the way L5 is playing, from the way they understand their drafts, I, I don't think that was completely intentional. They just wanted the 10 kill. I think it was as soon as they saw, they saw an opportunity and then they went with the opportunity. Yeah, I think so too, but it was really key because those 10 shots gave them the buffer what they yeah. needed to pressure yeah. on the map. They definitely did. So L5, with that win, takes themselves one point further in the stages here. This map. If they do win this one, they will be tied with Team Dignitas and that would force a tie-breaking situation. After looking at that first...